Hello everyone and Happy New Year from all of us here at First Presbyterian Church in Greensboro. And welcome to our combined Sunday School classes, the Agape class and the Young Men's Bible class. Two of our larger Sunday School adult classes here at First Presbyterian Church on North Elm Street at Fisher Park near downtown Greensboro. I'm Lane Reidenhauer and I lead the hymn singing for the Young Men's Bible Class and I want to welcome you and thank you for joining us as we return online for worship and study on this, the first Sunday of Christmas, Sunday, January 2nd. Of course, we've just finished the season of Advent and now we're in the season of Christmas or Christmas Tide, which runs through the 12 days of Christmas, ending with Epiphany this coming Thursday on January 6th. Please know that you're welcome to attend in person and worship with us here at the church. Our Rejoice Contemporary Service is at 9 o'clock in the Church Life Center, and our traditional service is at 11 o'clock here in the sanctuary. If you're unable to come to the church in person, you can watch our live stream of the 11 o'clock sanctuary service. Just go to our church website, www.fpcgreensboro.org. That's fpcgreensboro.org. And there you'll find links to the live stream as well as links to our church bulletins and other church news and information. Our senior pastor, the Reverend Jill Duffield, will be concluding her sermon series, The End of the World as They Knew It, with a sermon today called The Newfound Wisdom. And also today, we welcome back Professor Sandy Gravett as our Sunday School teacher, who will be presenting a new video series exploring the idea of light from Genesis to John, from Isaiah to Matthew, and from Psalms to Revelation. Our classes will be meeting in person here at the church to watch Sandy's video, but because Sandy is presenting on video, it gives us the chance to offer her teaching here online as well for those of you who are unable to be here in person. Sandy will join us in just a moment, but first, let's warm up our hearts and minds with the singing of a hymn, a spiritual carol, Go Tell It on the Mountain That Jesus Christ is Born. As always, I'll put the words up on the screen for you and invite you to sing along with me. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain, that Jesus Christ is born. While shepherds kept their watching, or silent flocks by night, behold, throughout the heavens there shone a holy light. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. The shepherds feared and trembled when low above the earth rang out the angel chorus that hailed the Savior's birth. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain, that Jesus Christ is born. Down in a lowly manger, the humble Christ was born. And God sent us salvation that blessed Christmas morn. 
Go tell it on the mountain Over the hills and everywhere Go tell it on the mountain That Jesus Christ is born I hope that everybody is enjoying a safe, healthy, and joyous Christmas season. Because, of course, on the liturgical calendar, we are still in Christmas, even though our trees may have long been discarded or packed away and our minds are set on the fact that it is now 2022. For this series, I'm a little bit ahead of the game as well. Because we will be in Epiphany for eight Sundays starting next week, I thought a series on light might be in order. It gives me an opportunity to jump around in the biblical text zone, as well as to stay current with the liturgical season. This Sunday, however, I want to begin a week ahead of time on this subject. Let us then go to the first biblical mention of the word light. It is in the book of Genesis. The story that opens the Bible tells us that the first words uttered by God for our ears are Yehi or They are well known but little understood and there is much to ponder. We generally translate let there be light as if the phrase was an imperative. Technically, however, it is not. The Hebrew grammar is more subtle. What we have is a third masculine singular imperfect verb that we're reading in the grammatical jussive. In English, we do not use the jussive for verbal mood. Thus, it can be trickier for us to understand. What is the distinction between an imperative and a jussive? The former would be a full-on command in the second person to an individual, if it were singular, or a group, if it were plural and there would be an expectation that the one or ones to whom the command was directed would hop right to it. In many languages, the jussive serves the same function, only rendered in the third person. I would not leave it there, however, because there is also the matter of tone. Even though the jussive can have an imperative edge, it often indicates more of the speaker's wish or an exhortation. It could also be advice or invitation or permission as well as prayer. In this regard, we have less God ordering up light and more God expressing what God desires. There should be light or it will be light. If you ponder this nuance, there is a nice twist on the way we see God, which I will talk about some later. Nonetheless, in this passage, it does not take long for the writer to follow up with action, as if it were a command. In the next breath, the phrasing is almost exactly the same. Vuyahi or. It means, then there was light. Note, too, that I am not translating the conjunction as and, which would be typical, and there was light. I like then because the light appears to be a consequence of God's words, which are an expression in the jussive of what God desires. But my point about lacking understanding of this passage is not actually a grammatical one. Another way to approach the unusual nature of this verse is to turn to what results from God's words, because here things get really curious. The verse previous had already told us that there was darkness covering the face of the deep. Now the deep is water. Knowing that little tidbit sets up not only what will constitute light, the opposite of darkness, but it also prepares us for what follows from light appearing. In verses 4 and 5, we read, God saw that the light was good, and God distinguished between the light and between the darkness. And God called the light day, 
and the darkness God called night, and there was evening and there was morning the first day. You may say, well, what's so curious about this? It's simple. The things that make for the day and the night, not to mention the sources of light, do not get created until day four when we get the sun and the moon and the stars on board. What then is this light that God creates on the first day? As you may already know, textual interpreters have wrestled with the problem for centuries. Most familiar to us, biblical literalists struggle with their insistence that the story can be read as an actual blueprint for how things unfolded, even when much of this story flies in the face about what we know from a scientific point of view. At the other extreme, those who insist that this story is wholly symbolic are missing out on a view of the universe and a cosmos that connects this story to other stories like it from the region and some key ideas that help us understand the cosmology of the ancients. Moreover, when we get caught between these two options, we lose out on some fruitful and interesting readings. And we don't want to do that because centuries of Jewish and then Christian commentators have worked with this text. While they might not have had our scientific knowledge in hand and been thinking about the universe in the ways that we do, they nonetheless came up with some fascinating possibilities for thinking through the problems with this text. For instance, if you are a fan of the mystical Jewish thought world and the Kabbalah, you might be familiar with the concept of the hidden light, the Or Haganus. This is the idea that some commentators put forward that God creates a special light on the first day of creation. But then God determines that this light was not suited for the world that God was creating, and thus God tucks it away for the world to come, what we are anticipating in the future. We could spend a lot of time exploring all the commentators have made of this kind of hidden light. Others say that light-bearing bodies were made on the first day, but it was not until day four that those light-bearing bodies were fixed in the heavens in their places. Indeed, for some, they will say that 24-hour days did not start until day four because it is only then that we get the markers of our 24-hour day in their proper places. You can see here how the commentators were trying to resolve a problem with the word day being used previously, but not having the very things that they knew constituted a day fixed until day four. Others will hold that the description of light on the first day is a description of God and we need to be thinking about God clothed in that light. Christian commentators will put a Christian spin on it and say that we're talking about the light that is reflected not only in God, but also in Jesus. The options for interpreting what this first light means go on and on because commentators across time saw in the text a puzzle. But one of the things we biblical scholars know when we are trying to get closer to the mindset of writers is we have to put aside our 21st century notions and thus to help understand the textual frame, we need to let go of what we know about our sun as a closer star burning bright and our Earth's orbit around it and the moon as a rock that has no light of its own, but rather 
its surface reflects the light of the sun. Why do we need to let go of that? Because it is not the world of the ancients. The cosmology of the biblical writers was shaped by what they observed and experienced. And while they were pretty interesting astronomers in terms of the way that they understood the movement of everything that was going on in the heavens, what they could see with the naked eye, they were naturally limited by their technology. And they thought overall about the world very differently than we did. As you can see from this diagram, they believed literally that waters had been divided and that there was a great deep below us and waters above the sky and that God was above and around it all and that what we could see was only part of what there was in our reality. For the biblical writers, some of these ideas came from cultures around them. For example, we know that much of the biblical text that we have in hand from the Torah was written in Babylon, and the Babylonians were, of course, shaped by stories that had been passed down for centuries. Indeed, there's a creation story from Sumeria in the 21st century BCE where the sun god Anu creates the world. That story says, When Anu, the Lord, made heaven shine, made earth dark, heaven and earth he held together as one, day did not shine, in night heaven stretched forth, earth bringing forth plant life did not glow on its own. This story, although fragmentary, is interesting. It does include the heaven shining, but not the earth. Conceptually, with regard to light, it is a little bit like what we see in Genesis. For the Genesis writer, there is a first primordial light that is spoken about in Genesis chapter 1, verse 3. That light appears to be independent of the sun, the moon, and the stars. They will later become vessels or conduits for this light, and they won't be the only ones. Many Jewish commentators, for instance, will teach the Torah is also a vessel or a conduit for this primordial light. Are we getting any ultimately persuasive interpretive options about what generations of readers have seen as a conundrum? Probably not. But one thing such exploration down so many different avenues encourages is an openness to our inquiry. And that openness can give us a next step. What would it mean to think about God in relationship first, as presented, to darkness and then also to light? In this story, we have to remember that God is initially imagined as existing alongside, hovering over the great deep or the dominant darkness. It's an interesting view of God. Let's first talk about why darkness is pictured as chaotic, this great roiling deep, and generally as the prevalent norm out there. We are talking about people who lived without electric light. That meant they spent a good deal of their time in the darkness, true darkness. Moonlight, starlight, firelight could only take you so far in cutting through that thick darkness. It was chaotic because you couldn't see everything around you. You didn't always know what was going on because your ability to perceive was limited. By associating God with creation and with order and with light, they were linking the divine to a number of things. The ability to see 
and to understand what was happening around them, to the ability of plants to grow and make foodstuffs and medicines, to bring about the conditions that kept alive grazing areas for herds, to create the conditions for hunting. Light was then indeed a source of life and thus that linkage to God was important. But then the pendulum swings back of course. It is not surprising that night and dark become associated with surreptitious things, with things that people want to keep secret because they might experience censure or feel shame if they were too widely known. And, as I noted above, there is a direct link here to ignorance as well, because one is unable to perceive clearly and without hindrance what is happening. This tendency to swing back into polar opposites, light and dark, however, needs to be stemmed a bit. We need to take a step back because the text itself doesn't do that. It lets us know clearly and directly that God was present in the darkness. And therein is our challenge. God is present in that darkness. God is fine there. But God speaks. There should be light. What are we to make of it? How are we to understand a God in darkness and a God who makes things visible held together at the same time? I want to take you to a story and it's a 21st century story to do that. Hold on to this thought and let me walk you through it slowly. On Christmas Day, the James Webb Telescope left Earth. It's going to be the world's largest and most complex space science observatory. A quick side note, you might not know that this telescope is named for the NASA administrator who ran the agency from 1961 to 1968 in the lead up to the moon landing and moon walk. Of local interest, he was born in Tally Ho, North Carolina, which is in Granville County, and he got his undergraduate degree at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, in 1928. Now back to my story. Following six months of commissioning in space, when the Webb Telescope starts producing images, scientists promise us that the resolution and what we learn is going to be breathtaking. In fact, if this piece of equipment performs as promised, it might be able to peek back to a mere 100 million years after the Big Bang. That's opposed to the 400 million years after the Big Bang that the Hubble telescope is able to see. Why the big difference? Because this telescope will see in infrared. I've given you here a picture of a space phenomenon on the left-hand side that is in visible light and then on the right-hand side in infrared to show you the difference. All telescopes are able to peer through the darkness and perceive the energy that is light traveling in waves and those telescopes transform it in a manner that brings that energy into the visible spectrum and allows us to study it more closely. But by working in infrared, the range of what can be seen is significantly expanded. Here's another example. I was particularly struck this past week by a quote from NASA Administrator Bill Nelson who said that the Webb instrument will provide a better understanding of our universe and our place in it, who we are, what we are, the search that's eternal. And here's one more visible light versus infrared light image for you. 
the eternal search for who we are and why we are here. It reminds me of what we're doing in our search for understanding something of God. Just like using visible light gives us glimpses of who God is, we recognize that the visible spectrum is only a fraction of the light that is out there. Thus, we only get glimpses of a fraction of who God is. But if we keep at that search for God, if we keep peering into what may look like only darkness, learning as we go, building on what generations before have known, we will likely continue to get glimpses, but those glimpses, like what you can see with the infrared, will give us a different, more complex, fuller view of the divine, even if it is still only a glimpse. This effort reminded me of a story that ran in Life magazine in May of 1955, shortly after the death of Albert Einstein in April of that year. William Miller, one of the editors of the magazine, had driven to Princeton to drop in on Einstein one day with a professor who wanted to ask Einstein some questions about religion and with his son, a first-year Harvard student for whom Einstein was a personal hero. When they met with Einstein, he firmly resisted answering any questions about religious faith. He was not interested in the confessional or in the absolute. He was, however, intrigued by this young man and his questions. It turns out that this young man had somewhat of a scientific bent as he was coming along, but once he had gone to college, he was confronted with a kind of philosophical nihilism. What is the reason for it all? What is the purpose of it all? Why should we engage in these efforts if we will only know partially? Einstein saw a moment to give this young man a piece of wisdom, and he did. Here's his quote. Do not stop to think about the reasons for what you are doing, about why you are questioning. The important thing is not to stop questioning. Curiosity has its own reason for existence. One cannot help but be in awe when contemplating the mysteries of eternity, of life, of the marvelous structure of reality. It is enough if one tries merely to comprehend a little of this mystery each day. And he concluded, never lose a holy curiosity. He might not have wanted to talk about religion, but Einstein certainly gives us a lesson about holiness and awe and mystery, and thus a lesson that applies to our search for God. And it rolls us back around to this initial text, God speaking and light coming into being. It is natural and it is normal that we are drawn to the light. We are human beings and light is necessary for our existence. It is what makes life on this planet possible. But when we read God as also present in that murky darkness, we become aware of something that might otherwise get lost. We begin to grasp that we know God only because God chooses to make God's self visible in some way to us, creating the world as we know it, finding a way to connect to us, seeking to be seen and to be experienced. These are the things that allow us to get a glimpse of the divine in our visible spectrum. 
And while that might be challenge enough for most of us, there is also an additional level of challenge that is out there. If we keep fine tuning those glimpses, discovering God in more and more intricate detail, we might too become like telescopes. We might become like instruments that can see more than what is on the visible spectrum. We might be able to train our eyes to look into the darkness and discover even more glimpses of the light of God. That's something worth thinking about as we move into Epiphany next week. And I will see you then. Thank you for your attention.